Good morning and happy Sabbath. Thank you for worshiping with us. Here's a few announcements. We have a Women's Spring Tea Social on Sunday, April 14th at 2 p.m. here at the Church Fellowship Hall. Um, the DAX con constituency meeting on Sunday, April 28th at 4 p.m. at the app. The church is holding a blood pressure clinic at the church on Sunday, May 5th from 1 to 3. Thank you. Do we have any visitors that are here with us for the first time or second time um, who aren't members of the church? We'd like to extend you a warm welcome and a gift, and we'd like to ask you to stand so that we can identify you and share that gift with you. I know that some uh, feel already at home, and that's, <laughs> that's totally fine, too, uh, but we want to make sure that if you're visiting us for the first time, uh, that you leave here with a little... Uh, souvenir, a little reminder of your church family here in Ogden. So we'll be on the lookout, and um, if we spot you, we'll hand you something uh, here soon. Uh, on the announcements as well, we, uh, we have a constituency meeting for our school. Uh, the churches that are constituents of the school are the Ogden English Church and the Ogden Spanish Church. And so we will be coming together on April 28th at four o'clock in the Yak building. And before that, beforehand, since the Constitution will be revised, it has been sent to the church members. If you are a church member and you have not received a digital copy of the Constitution, please feel free to reach out to our sister Patty, who, who has the list of members, so that she can include you and get the Constitution out to you. If you would like a physical copy of the Constitution, we also have those. 
Um, obviously, we're a little bit more limited on those just because we want to, you know, save the trees and hopefully the digital version is, is fine. But if you would like a physical copy, please reach out to any of the school chair, school board chairs. That is Brother Arturo Lomeli or Max Shirtliff. That's only if you would like a physical copy of the Constitution. So please make plans, make arrangements to join us on April 28th at 4 o'clock p.m. at the YAC to take part of our constituency meeting for our school. The other announcement we have is the first reading of a transfer. Our brother Clinton Shim is transferring from the Milimani SDA Church in Kenya to the Ogden SDA Church. And there is also a first reading of transfer for Amani, and I don't even know if I should try this last name, Hraibowi, Hraibowi, um, I apologize, from the Evergreen SDA Church in Ohio to the Ogden SDA Church in Utah. So that is the first reading of our uh, brothers and sisters in, uh, to the church here. Thank you. and believe there is no time for delay i believe the bible is clear jesus will return in but four short years i come before you today to tell you that i have been shown in vision father miller's message was light the advent people were traveling on a path toward a bright and a holy city this is not the first time the end of the world has been prophesied by a fool, nor will it be the last if you do not renounce these radical ideas. You will not be welcome here in this house of worship. This was only the beginning of our journey. Her visions do not come from God. But my friends, she speaks with great tenderness of the word of the Lord. Holy Spirit encouraged our Advent hope. There were people who didn't listen and they fell off the path. I really believe this doctrine which you preach. I was lost and now I'm found. We must follow the word of God over the rule of men. We feel love, the love of Jesus. It lifts us up, it carries us forward and it will guide us home. I was made for you. Good morning, happy Sabbath. So some of my missionary friends had posted this on Facebook and I thought, oh, that would be awesome. And then all of a sudden last night or I found out, oh, it's happening this week in our local Ogden Theater. So any of you guys that can go at 7 p.m. this Wednesday or Thursday at the Ogden Tinseltown Theater, it's such a neat opportunity. Do you remember when Desmond Doss Hacksaw Ridge came out and we were able to like invite friends and family? Um, I know I'm going with my friend Bree and my parents and maybe some other friends and family. And you can also send them the link on YouTube for those that can't physically go depending on school or work. Um, Tell it to the world is similar, pretty much the same as what's going to happen in um, the theaters, the hopeful. So you can look up Tell It to the World on YouTube for free. And I just want to say that I'm a movie I got to see recently, Courageous Heart. Irina Sendler saved 2,500 Jewish children during World War II. And um, another story that recently touched my heart from North Korea, a young woman named Kim, that there's in North Korea, if you try to escape, you are in prison. The second time, you can be tortured more severely. The third time, you're executed. Yet, she didn't give up crossing the river. Um, the second time, she made it because she had been listening to the radio on Adventist World Radio and want, accepted Jesus and wanted to get baptized. She met a pastor. He baptized her. She went to one of our Adventist colleges by foot, got more training. Then she risked her life the third time. 
and she didn't make it over the border. They, she was apprehended, and, and they sent her back to be executed, but she, she was free. She died loving Jesus, and she knew that God would send others to help her family. So just by going to this movie and inviting a friend or family to come with you, a neighbor, a coworker, or sending them this link, tell it to the world, you can help save their family and help them realize that we have so much hope. It doesn't matter the sad things happening in our world. Jesus is with us, and he's coming soon to wipe away our tears and take us home. Oh, I'm going to have a little closing prayer for that. Dear Heavenly Father, you know I figured this out last minute thanks to you yesterday, but it's not too late to share this blessing and be encouraged. We have nothing to fear for the future unless we forget how you've led in the past. And your plan is to take us home someday soon. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Can the deacons come forward? The offering today is for Hope Channel International. The impact of Hope Channel is, is evident in the inspiring stories of God's children like Pastor Ross and Baby Aurora. Ross overcame drug addiction to become an ordained seven-day Adventist pastor after discovering Hope Sabbath, Hope Sabbath School. Following Baby Aurora's... Uh, she was miraculously healed thanks to our most watched Let's Pray program and prayers on her behalf from our global community. With your offering today, Hope Channel can continue to share the transformational love of Jesus Christ with people all over the world by producing high-quality Christian content to reach new audiences in innovative ways. Our Hope Study platform is online and offers by Bible studies on a range of topics. So far, over 300,000 people have started a course. Just one year after the platform went live. People are hungering for the Bible's truth. As we read in Proverbs 11:12, whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and who and no and one who waters will be watered. By faithful supporting Hope Channel International, you are not only blessing others by your by your yourself as well by bringing hope to those who need it by telling them the love of Jesus Christ.
Okay, hello, happy Sabbath. <laughs> happy Sabbath, everyone. Today's a different day. Ginger was supposed to be here. Of course, I'm not Ginger. <laughs> but she had an incident happen this morning. Her husband had to go into the hospital, and he has an infection in his spine. So I want to let you say a little prayer for her at the end of this story. So I was trying to come up with something fast. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I know you've all heard this story before. Um, one day, Jesus was talking with his disciples after the sermon, um, a little sermon about God's love. He drew a picture that was so simple and clear to understand. It was a picture of two houses, one built on a rock and the other on the sand, and both looked alike and seemed good to live in. But everyone was listening to Jesus and noticed he was building on two different foundations. So for those people who made up their minds to follow Jesus' teaching and let love, love of God fill their hearts were like the man who dug deep in the ground and laid his foundation on a rock. So on the other hand, uh, and, uh, people who refused to follow Jesus' teachings decided to go on living the same mean lives, were hurting other people, not helping other people, and they ended up building their house on the earth with no foundation. So the days ahead, fierce storms came and blew on the house. And houses and great floods and trials would come to them. And at that time of testing, the kind of foundation they had built their houses on would be revealed. Okay, So when a man builds his house on love, though it cannot be seen, is like a rock and it lasts uh, eternally with God himself. The person who loves God and loves others, who lives um, not for himself, but to help others and help God, um, can end up living with God for eternally, eternal time. On the other hand, a person who lives for himself, who does not care for others or help others, and only wants to you know, build his own house and uh, only do for himself. Um, he has no love for others, so his foundation is built on the sand. And in the storms, his um, house falls. So like the Lord says in 724, when the rains come and descend, the floods came and the winds blew, and the house that was built on the sand stood firm. But on the, um, when the rains, on the other house, the one on the sand, the rains came, the winds blew, and um, his house fell and collapsed in the sand. So we need to have our foundation in God. Where do we want to have our foundation of our houses? Do we want them in God, on a rock, on a solid rock? Amen. Say? And I love this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and to give you hope and not harm you, and plans to give you a future. Okay, thank you. So now I'm going to say a little prayer for Dave and Ginger. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord. Please be with Ginger and Dave in the hospital with his infection, that the doctors and nurses will help him to be able to heal him and clear up that infection so he can get out of pain and be healed. Please guide and be with us all throughout the rest of this Sabbath day, oh Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hello. Oh, there. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I would like to invite you to open your Bibles to Hebrews 11.3. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, 
so that what is seen was not made out of what it was visible. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. It's time for a garden of prayer. At this time, I invite everyone to uh, kneel for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for um, this church. I pray for the ministries that we have, such as our Pathfinders and our school. I pray for the leadership um, in our church. I pray for the families that are here being represented. And I have a special prayer for those who are in need of health mercies. I know um, Mario has family that are in need of health mercies, and we have um, Ginger and Dave Bishop. and many more that we may not know about, that you'd know about, Lord, and that um, we just pray for them, Lord. Um, we bring all these petitions to your feet. Please take them and give us the peace that we need and the comfort of knowing that you are in control. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Join us now for praise worship. Our first song that we're going to be singing for you today is 10,000 Reasons. Thank you. 
our next song is Here I Am to Worship. Please stand up for opening him. Two fifty one. See his 
be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, six of our deacons to please join me up here in the uh, stage. Um, if Caleb Mesa, Josh Mesa, John Mamuyak, Daniel Johnson, Lee Robinson, and Chris Lomeli, if you can please join us up here. And then I'd also like to invite all of the ordained elders that are here with us today, if you can also please come and stand behind uh, the deacons that are before us. I'd like to read a bit of scripture with you. I'm reading from the book of Acts, chapter 6, verses 3, 4, 6, and 7. And the apostle said, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So church, today we are going to witness the ordination of these deacons you have here before you. The ordination of deacons is a recognition of, like what the Word of God says, men full of the Spirit and also full of wisdom. And in the ordination... As a symbol, again, it's, there's no special power that we're about to pour on them, but what it represents and what it symbolizes is that these individuals have shown their desire to serve and love God. And so the church comes together to recognize them and to impart the Spirit so they can continue their service. As some of you know, uh, some of our deacons here have already served for many, many years. <laughs> they didn't just start 
a couple of months ago. Many of them, and, I, and, I, and I'd say the majority of them have served for many years. But it's time now that the church recognize them and let them know that we see and we value what service they provide, not only to the Lord, but also to the church. And so at this time, we want to recognize them, but before that, we want to pray for them. We want to place God's presence and His Holy Spirit upon them. And so we will do so just as the biblical account tells us to do so, which is placing our hands upon them so that the Spirit may be with them. So we're going to invite them, if they can please kneel, and then the elders behind them will place their hands upon them as we pray. And so, church, we invite you, where you are seated down, please join us in prayer as we ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit upon them at this time. Let us pray. Our great Father, we come to you today with joyful and thankful hearts for the amazing God that you are, a God that is just, that is powerful, but overall, a God that is love. That is the God that we trust in. That is the God that we serve. And before you now stand six deacons, six men who have, through actions and through their time of service, shown to you that they love you, that they want to serve you, that they want to honor you with their lives. And so today, Lord, as a church, we want to recognize the effort and the service they have provided to you and to this church. And that is why, as the elders of your church place their hands upon them, we ask for a very special way that your spirit may be upon them now and forever. Just as you have led them and guided them through their life to all the way up to this point, that you may continue to do so, Lord. That they may be examples of what it means to live covered by the blood of Jesus. That they may be examples of what it means to love a God who is merciful and patient. That they may be examples, not only in this church, but to the world and in their homes, in their schools, at work, wherever they may go, that you are love. And so, Lord, we thank you for what they have done. We thank you for the heart that you have placed in them, a heart of service. And now we just ask that just as you have led them and guided them to this point, Lord, that you may never abandon them, but instead that you may continue to use them for your honor and glory. From the youngest to the oldest, Lord, they are your children. You love them. Continue to use them as you see fit. And Lord, as a church, allow us to appreciate what they do in honor of your name. All of this, Lord, we recognize and thank, not because any of us here are deserving or because we are good. None, none are good. But it's in the name, in the glorious and powerful name of your Son who gave his life for us. It's in that name that we pray, in Jesus Christ. Amen. So at this point, we'd like to recognize them with a certificate. As we have mentioned in the past, these certificates are a recognition of their ordination. This ordination uh, continues with them, not only in this church, but wherever they go, wherever they will be. And... Uh, there are ordained deacons not just here in Ogden, but if they were to one day, and please, let's pray that it doesn't happen, but if they were to one day go or move somewhere else, this ordination will follow them wherever they will go. And so this certificate is a recognition of their service, of their time, of their love for God, and the church's recognition as well of what they have done for the honor and glory of Jesus. Can we give them a round of applause? And can we give the Lord a round of applause for calling them and and using them for his service.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. The song we will be singing together will be, Will You Love Jesus More? Savage Church, and we praise the Lord because I, I, I hope that is our prayer, that we love Jesus more, that we may fall in love with him, that each day it would be a, a getting to know him more and surrendering to him more. So what an, what an amazing song, what a powerful song. 
and what a prayer it should be in our hearts to love Jesus more. We're glad that you're here with us today. We praise the Lord for uh, accepting his call to come today and worship together as a family. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful Sabbath and a blessed Sabbath when we can come together. Any moment that we can gather is reason enough to praise the Lord. And I'm not going to stop saying it because it's the reality. And, and as humans, we, we fail to see things until they have passed. It's not until down the line that we can look back and say, man, I should have took more advantage of, of that time or that opportunity. And so we're living in that time of opportunity now. We are currently in the time of coming together and being able to worship. And prophetically, we, we know that this will soon end as we understand it now. So why not take advantage and worship together as a family? Now, the Lord wants us to to go beyond just a couple hours on Sabbath, you know, he would, he would desire and he would hope that his church would spend more time than just a couple of hours on, on Sabbath morning. But we're working towards that. And we're, we'll head in a direction where we can live a lifestyle of complete worship to our God. Last Sabbath, we were blessed with a message. Elder Brad uh, Newton shared with us a powerful message. And um, I, I was unable, I, w I missed it live, but I was blessed to see it afterwards on YouTube. So if any of you have ever missed a message live, just know that you can go back to our YouTube page and you can revisit and watch the messages that uh, you have missed. And so that's how I enjoyed the message last, uh, of last Sabbath. And it was such, just such a powerful message, a reminder that we are walled up by sin, but there is one who reaches over the wall, and his name is Jesus Christ. And because he reach, reaches over... He makes a bridge that once again connects us to our Father. And it's, it's because of Jesus Christ that you and I have an opportunity to be saved. And so that's the same Jesus we're going to talk about today. Um, so I'd like to spend as much time as we can. I know that um, I always try to shorten it up, and I don't. So I'm really going to try and stay on point. Th this is going to have to be a two-part uh, message, and it is a two-part message, but I want to make sure that I don't leave out the important elements of the message. So let's go ahead and spend some time asking the Lord for his presence, for his blessing, and then we'll jump straight into the study for today. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, we humble ourselves in recognition that outside of you there is nothing. And so as we open your word and as we learn together, we ask that you may reveal yourself to us so that we may embrace you, that we may trust in you, that we may have hope in you. And as we walk out of this place today, we may have one thing in mind, and that is Jesus Christ. So thank you once again. We ask this in his glorious name. Amen. We live in a time when a lot of things are being exposed. You can literally go online and search up pretty much anything, and, and you, you will find information on it. Now, you have to be cautious on if the sources are reliable or not. But if you dig deep enough, you will find information. And so we live in a time where, because of the access of information, a lot is being exposed. And so what people are starting to realize, something that I think we as Adventists knew a long time ago already, but what a lot of people are starting to wake up to and understand is that the institutions and the governments that have ruled society for so many years are no longer trustworthy. A lot of people are starting to realize that. And, and they're starting to notice, hey, these institutions and these systems of government are not in place for us. Now, I'm not going to get into politics here, although we could, but let's leave that out for a moment. Let's just generalize and come to the understanding that we cannot trust in a human institution or in a human-led government to be our solution. And a lot of people are waking up to that. Now, society views those Christians, and there's, there's different groups. There's a group that look at believers as people that are ridiculous and fanatics. Prayer is frowned upon. Uh, the simply fact of being a believer is grounds to be ridiculed. And then there's the other extreme 
that wants to impose a Christian lifestyle, Christian principles, and Christian beliefs on others. And we know where that leads to, which is a dangerous path uh, towards Christian nationalism. So we are presented with, with problematic society that, that rejects our understanding of God's kingdom. And so the world and, and the way the institutions and the, and the world governments work, and, and I'm talking specifically of our government in our country, is that they present you and they present us with the illusion of choice. You are, you are given the idea that you have a choice. And so we're, given, we're, we're, we're presented with two political heroes, two different groups, and you have to choose between these two heroes. But church, you and I know deep inside that the solution is neither of those. Prophetically, we must know that the solution to humankind's problem and our issues here on earth do not come from a political candidate, do not come from a political party, and do not come from a human-led system. We should be very clear on that. If, if, if anything Adventists should know is that our problem will not be resolved by a human-led institution. The government is not the solution. A candidate is not the solution. We as followers of Christ and believers of God understand and know that our only solution is Jesus Christ. And that is the candidate, that is the individual, that is the king, that is the politician, if you want to call him that way, that is the one whom we should be pushing for and pressing and going out and telling the world he is the solution. So it saddens me when Christians and specifically Adventists fall into the trap of the enemy to believe that a human institution, a human uh, uh, government, a human-led government, a political candidate, a political party is going to be the solution. So then what begins to happen? Many Adventists, many Christians long for a barrage of prophetic fulfillments. They begin to want to give a prophetic meaning to current events. That happens a lot within Christian circles and, and specifically in Adventist circles. Something came in the news and what does that mean prophetically? We want, we, there's this desire that every new event has to have a prophetic explanation. If you would have heard the things that were coming out of Christian circles regarding the eclipse. If you would have heard the ideas that were coming from Adventist circles regarding the eclipse. There's this desire to want to place a prophetic meaning on every new event. And so we begin to want and get hungry for prophetic interpretation. And we start walking the line, the thin line between what is conspiracy and what is truth. I've heard a lot of people say, and I think I've shared this with you before, I've heard a lot of people say that we shouldn't only preach the love of Jesus. It's fine, it's good, but it's, enough is enough. I, I want to be preached prophecy. The love of Jesus is fine and it's good, but when are we going to start preaching prophecy? I've heard that. I've been told that. Too much focus, too much emphasis on the love of Jesus, the love of God. We know that already. That's, that's baby's food. That's little milk. Give us the hard stuff. Give us the, 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 real, the real food. You see... I have an issue because the premise of that comment is wrong. First and foremost, because we will never, ever in our lifetime and throughout eternity ever stop talking about the love of God. If there is something that guarantees our salvation, it's the love of God. And so we can never, never stop talking about it. As a matter of fact, for eternity, the only thing we will be talking about is God's love. We will be praising him for his love. So the premise of that comment to me is wrong. When we say enough or I'm good about hearing the love of God, now I need more solid, more emphasis on prophecy. That, that, it's wrong. The framework of that, of that ideology is wrong. Because first of all, the love of God is what sustains us. 
It's why we are here. And it's why we know we, where we are headed. So we will never, ever stop talking about his love. But the other reason is because even when we talk about prophecy, it's inevitable that God's love will always come up. You see, there's a problem because as much as you want to downplay God's love, if you talk about something the right way, which is the biblical way, there is no getting away from God's love. So if you talk prophecy, and prophecy is the biblical prophecy, you're going to get back to the point of God's love. There's no escaping it. Not that I want to escape it, but there's no escaping it. Anything, evangelism, prophecy, uh, spiritual growth, the health message, everything that is presented when it's done in the biblical way always comes back to God's love. Now, here's the other side. If you're speaking prophecy, if you're speaking the health message, if you're speaking evangelism, and it doesn't come back, circle back to God's love, then you're doing it the wrong way. Because God's love should always be at the center of what we talk about. It must always circle back to that. And so then we, f we find ourselves with individuals that use prophecy to bring fear, to use prophecy to manipulate, who use prophecy to perhaps uh, force people to accept God. But I believe that is the wrong way to present the Bible truths and the prophetic message of God. And so today, church, what I'd like for us to study and to revisit is a prophecy that undoubtedly will return us to the love of God, that without fighting it will naturally bring up the love of God. And I want us to look at this example so that we can see that even in intense and deep prophecy, the love of God is inevitable. When prophecy is done the right way, when prophecy is presented the right way, when the spirit of prophecy is presented the right way, God's love will always be exalted. And so just keep that in mind when, when you turn on someone on the TV and they're preaching prophecy and it get, gets your attention because the beast and they connect it with current events and the eclipse that just happened, I just want you to pay attention and be cautious to make sure that what you're listening to and what you're watching is always taking you back to the love of God. Because that prophetic message, as, as right as it can be, if it's not taking you to Jesus, it's a waste of time. It has lost its meaning. And apply that to anything else. If you're watching something on the health message, and it's very good, and it's very nutritious, and it's, and it's, it's effective, and it's true for your body, if at the end of the message, and if at the end of the presentation, it doesn't lead you back to the love of God, be careful. Be cautious. Everything we look at must always lead us back to the love of God. Because church, that's the only way you and I will be saved, God's love. And so I pray that today, when we leave this place, we may leave so, and man, this, this song was, was, was so powerful, we may leave so longing for more of God's love, longing for a desire to be more with him. And so in order to understand, we're going to like, take a look at a prophecy, and that prophecy is in Daniel chapter 9. Now, in Daniel chapter 9, and a lot of the people that I've studied with and the Pathfinders are not going to let me lie, I've shared with them that Daniel chapter 9 is a turning point. It's, it's, it's one of the climactic points in the history of humanity and the plan of salvation. In order to understand the plan of salvation, you and I need to have a clear understanding of Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 is, a, is, a, is an essential turning point in, hum, in humanity's history and God's plan of salvation in order to understand why and how it's taking place. And so that's the prophecy we're going to use as an example today, and we're going to be Bible scholars together and try to understand the message that God is revealing to his, through his prophet Daniel and for us today. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. Now, a little bit while you're turning your pages and, and you're heading there, I want to give you a little bit of context as to how to understand Daniel chapter 9. Because 
when it comes to prophecy, we have to be diligent and we have to be cautious. As you know, there's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of Hebrew, Hebrew styles and elements of Hebrew understanding that we have to be familiar with in order to understand how the message is being shared. And so the style, the, the, the Hebrew style that a lot of the Bible writers utilize is that which describes the result or consequences first, and then it proceeds to give the reason why it happened. So basically, what we're seeing is that they present effect and then cause. In our Western mindset, we, our, our idea of presenting something is cause and effect, right? That's what we're comfortable with. That's not the Hebrew mindset. That's not the biblical, biblical writer's mindset. The style that which, for which they present, uh, especially prophecy, is that they first describe the results, the outcome, the consequence, and then they say, this is why. These are the causes. These are the reasons. So we call this the effect to cause. And Daniel is an expert in this. And so Daniel, we're going to read Daniel 9, but in order to understand Daniel 9, we first have to be at least a little bit familiar with Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 8, because Daniel is using that cause, that effect to cause style. So in Daniel chapter 7, what we see is that Daniel presents the son of man involved in the end time heavenly trial. So Jesus is presented as that judge. In Daniel chapter 8, he depicts Christ as the ongoing priest. It's that priestly behavior, the prince of hosts. And in Daniel chapter 9, which is where we're going to read, we are presented with Messiah, the anointed one, in his first advent. In other words, his earthly ministry with a special focus on his work as a sacrifice for the sin of humanity. So if you put it in chronological order, you're seeing that it's backwards, right? It's first presented Christ the judge, Christ the intercessor, and then Christ the sacrifice. Chronologically, it's backwards, right? Because we know it was Christ the sacrifice first, then the intercessor, and then finally the judge. But in prophecy, as I mentioned, it is first effect, and then lastly, it is cause. So it is chronologically in reverse. Okay, I just want you to keep that in mind. I want you to, to understand that. And, and John, who is, when you read Revelation, the book of Revelation, and you're trying to understand the prophecies, which is married to Daniel, keep this as a principle of interpretation. This is how John speaks as well. Okay, in Revelation chapter 19, uh, that's how he, rep he represents salvation in, in Revelation 14, the three angels' message, um, 144,000 who are worshiping and already praising, and then it's the cause. So just keep this in mind as a, as a principle of interpretation, especially when it comes to prophecy. And so what we're seeing in, in Daniel chapter 7, 8, and 9 is Christ as judge, Christ as high priest, and Daniel chapter 9, which we're going to read, is Christ as sacrifice. So with that, context in mind. Let's go ahead and read here now Daniel chapter 9 verses 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet that the desolation of Jerusalem would last how long? Seventy years. Be Bible students with me here today, church. The desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Now, 30 years have already passed since he received the prophecy of the 2,300 evenings and mornings. As a matter of fact, Babylon fell a little bit less than a year ago when Daniel is writing Daniel, when, when Daniel's recording his prayer in Daniel chapter 9. Babylon already fell. And so 
now it is the Medes and the Persians who are ruling. And according to the prophecy of the 2,300 evenings and mornings, this is the ram power. It's no longer the lion, but now this is the ram power of Mede and Persia. So to give some dates, this is happening around 538 before Christ. And Babylon fell just a couple of months before in 539 before Christ. This is when Daniel is, is, is writing this, when he's praying, when he's receiving these messages. It's been about 30, 30 years since he last received the 2,300 the 2, uh, year prophecy. The Bible tells us that Cyrus is reigning at this time with his co-regent, Darius. Okay, now, to you and me, Cyrus probably is irrelevant. We could care less. But to a Jew and one that has studied Scripture, when they hear the name Cyrus, alarm bells start going off. Good alarm bells. Because Isaiah the prophet in chapter 44, the end of chapter 44, and chapter, in the beginning of chapter 45, had been given a prophecy a couple years before that said a ruler by the name of Cyrus would arise and call for the rebuilding of Jerusalem and its temple. So if a prophet has said, hey, there's going to come a time where this ruler named Cyrus is going to be used by God to bring God's people back. And you're alive and you're under captivity in, in Babylon and now a captive of the Persians and the Medes. And all of a sudden there's a ruler by the name of Cyrus who comes. And all of a sudden in your heart, joy starts coming and, and happening and excitement. Because you believe that according to prophecy, this is the individual that is going to allow God's people to return to the promised land. And not just that, but he is also remembering. So Daniel's not only getting excited because of the name Cyrus, but he's excited because there was a specific time given, a specific number of years. And we read that in verse 2. How many years was the desolation of Jerusalem supposed to last? Seventy. Those 70 years had started 68 years before when the Israelites, when the Jews were captive, were, were, finally, were ended as a nation, and Babylon took them captive. They became exiles. That happened 68 years before what Daniel is writing at this time. So there's only two years left, only two more years left. So not only is this Cyrus come to power, but now Daniel is saying there's only two more years left. And that's why in verse 2, you see that he says, Father, I understood from scriptures that according to the word that you gave to Jeremiah. By the way, Jeremiah presents this in Jeremiah chapter 25 and also in Jeremiah chapter 29. When you get a chance, you can read it there. And, Jer and to Jeremiah was given the prophecies. It's going to be seven years of desolation of Jerusalem. So Daniel says, according to the prophecy given to, to the prophet Jeremiah, the desolation of Jerusalem would only last 70 years. So Daniel is, he's getting worked up and he's getting excited and he's saying, okay, we have Cyrus, who is the one that God has chosen to give the order, and the 70 years are coming up. Two more years left. It's been 68 years. And so this is the reason why Daniel is having this prayer. This is why he's praying. He is looking forward to God fulfilling his promises. He is trusting that God will carry out his prophecies. You see, many times we read these things and we think that just randomly Daniel decided to pray. Yeah, he fell on his knees and he just said, hey, what's up? It's purposeful, my brothers and sisters. There's a reason behind it. And Daniel knows, and he explicitly says it in verse 2, because of what you told Jeremiah, the prophecy, Lord, I'm excited. When is it happening? When is it coming? I, I mean, I know there's, there's maybe two more years left, but Cyrus is already in power. Maybe, maybe we can make this happen sooner. 
And so this is what leads Daniel to openly express this prayer that we find ourselves in Daniel chapter 9. So Daniel is excited. But something that we also find as we look now into the prayer is that Daniel is also humble. And this is important. I want you to understand this because although Daniel is aware, and perhaps most of Israel and the other Jews were not aware, but although Daniel is aware of prophecy, he knows the timeline, he knows the individuals, hear me out, church, he knows the players and he knows those who will carry out the prophecies, he's excited, he's happy, but he is also humble. And sometimes humility is missing in those Adventists who know a lot about prophecy. Because I know the timeline. Because I know what's supposed to happen. Because I know how it's going to play out. Because I have all the information together. We sometimes come off as arrogant. And we're missing humility in the way we approach prophecy. Daniel wasn't wrong. He wasn't wrong. He was reading from Isaiah. He knew that the, the, the individual was Cyrus. He wasn't wrong. He was reading from Jeremiah. He knew it was 70 years. But he remained humble in knowing that prophecy belongs to God. And knowing that prophecy is an attribute that God shares with his people and is not something that belongs to us. The spirit of prophecy, the gift of prophecy, is something that the Holy Spirit decides who to give. It doesn't belong to me. I am not the owner of the spirit of prophecy. I am not the originator of the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy and prophecy in itself belongs to God. And so although we may have some information, and although the numbers may match, and although the players, we may know them, we must always remain humble in the light of prophecy. Prophecy belongs to God. And so Daniel, excited and happiness, and, and you, can, you can imagine him we're going to be able to leave this place and we're finally going home, he also understands that it's important to remain humble. And so this is where we find that this prayer in Daniel chapter 9 is divided in four sections. We're not going to read the whole thing. I encourage you, I motivate you, read the prayer when you get an opportunity. I'm just going to show you in a very summarized way the four sections to Daniel's prayer. Number one, we see that there's an invocation. He invokes God by describing him as awesome and as faithful to his covenant. The invocation, the introduction, Daniel isn't saying, hey, we have earned this, so you better make it happen. No, he says, you are powerful and mighty. You are God. And if someone has been faithful to the covenant, it is you, God. Humility, humility, humility. The second part is a confession of the sin of Israel. And he goes above and beyond because in the confession of, of, of the sins of Israel, he includes himself. And in the language that he uses, he says, we have sinned against you. There's a confession. If someone messed this thing up, Lord, it wasn't you. If someone broke the covenant and the opportunity to get this right... It wasn't you. It was us. Humility, humility, humility. The third part of his prayer is an acknowledgement of the open shame that Israel is living at this time in captivity. And the shame that Jerusalem is in desolation. But it's also an acknowledgement that the desolation of Jerusalem and the exile of God's people is because of their rebellion. Their rebellion, our rebellion against God, our rebellion against your law, and our lack of repentance. So he's invoking God for who he is. He is confessing the sins of his people. He is acknowledging the reason why, and then he ends his prayer with supplication. He tells God, please turn back from your wrath. Pardon Israel's sin because of your great mercy, not our righteousness. Act on our behalf for your people, 
for your city, for your temple. But, Lord, do it for your namesake. Humility, humility, humility. If someone could have said, you said it. You got you to gotta stay. You got to keep to your promises. Hey, you're the one that gave us this prophecy. You're the one that told Jeremiah. You're the one that told Isaiah, hey, clock is ticking. When's it happening? That's not the approach of Daniel. Church, we could learn a lot from Daniel's approach. As Adventists with a powerful prophetic message, we can learn a lot from Daniel. We don't approach prophecy arrogantly. The times match up. Oh, these ignorant people, they don't know. They don't, they don't know what we know. Look at the 2300. Yeah, it obviously ends here in 1844. We could learn a lot from Daniel's humility who says, God, it's because of you. And I ask you to do it, not for our sake, not because of our righteousness, which was the mistake of the Pharisees, church. The mistake of the Pharisees was, if we remain faithful, God will find us favorable and say, okay, now I'm going to do it. Because you guys are so good. Because you guys have been so faithful. Here I come. That was the mistake of the Pharisees. Daniel isn't making that mistake. He's saying, look how he's, his supplication goes. Turn your wrath. Turn back from your wrath. Pardon Israel's sins because of your great mercy and not our righteousness. Do it for your namesake, Lord, not because we've earned it. Do it because you are God, powerful but all merciful. We could take a lot to learn from Daniel's approach to prophecy. That arrogance, I don't want to hear the love of God anymore. Teach me prophecy. Show me prophecy. Church, we're looking at prophecy right now. The, the, the backbone of the Adventist prophetic message, and the only thing that I'm seeing stand out is God's love. So to say, I don't want to hear about God's love anymore, I want to hear about prophecy, is to be arrogant in light of prophecy. Is to not approach it in the spirit for which God gave his people his, his truths. This is, we're looking at prophecy. This is prophecy, Daniel chapter 9. And all I'm seeing is Daniel saying, you are good, we are not. You are faithful, we are not. You are merciful, we are not. Do it for your sake. Do it for your namesake. Prophecy should always lead us to the love of Jesus, to the love of God. So what's interesting in Daniel's prayer, and I mentioned it already, is that although he is innocent, because Daniel, if you recall the story, was taken to Babylon as an adult, as an old guy, taken as a boy, as a child. How is, how is this his fault? How is the desolation of Jerusalem? How is the exile of God's people Daniel's fault? You can't blame a kid for something his parents have done. But in the humility, Daniel says, we he includes himself. Although innocent, he says that the desolation of the temple and the rebellion of his people is their fault. It's our fault. And so in his prayer, he says, we have sinned. Now, this is important, and don't miss out on it, because, because he took that, because he, he takes part, although innocent, Daniel takes the role of a prophetic intercessor. Do you know other prophets that that took the role of prophetic intercessor well you can think of Moses right Moses was one of those many different prophets in the Old Testament took on that role of prophetic intercessor in other words Daniel not only with his prayer but with his actions it's saying it's all because of Jesus the prophetic intercessor his role his job is to point to Jesus although innocent died for your sins and my sins. The prophetic intercessor, his role is to say what I am doing now, although he doesn't necessarily ask for it, but what he says with his actions is, this is what Messiah will do. Innocent, without fault, without sin, but he will take our place. He will die the death that we deserve. And so Daniel, not only with his message, not only with his prayer, but in his actions, he is also pointing to Jesus. So you tell me, church, if prophecy doesn't always lead us back to Jesus, to the love of God, to who he is, to his loving character, to his forgiving uh, love and grace towards us. We've not even passed verse 2, and we already identify elements, and then we read the rest of the prayer, and we see it's always pointing back 
to God's love. We can never escape God's love, and I pray that you never want to escape his love because his love is amazing. His love is sufficient, and he's done it all for you and for me. So the prophecy hasn't even been given. Daniel hasn't even received the prophecy yet, and the focus is already on the saving actions of Messiah. Think about that. Daniel hasn't even received the message from, angel, from the angel. And we're already being pointed towards the saving actions of Messiah. So how important it is for you and me today, church, that when we approach anything, we may find Jesus in it. And as I mentioned before, whether it's the health message, whether it's evangelism, whether it's prophecy, but whatever it is, how important is it for us to be able to identify that Jesus is in everything that we do, that Jesus should be the focal and center point. And I tell you once again, if you're reading, sharing, listening, watching, anything, and Christ is missing, please be careful. Please be conscious. Because although it might have some truth to it, it is missing the most important element. Although it might have some truth to it, it is missing what is necessary for our salvation. What good is it for me to tell you, you need to eat this way and not lead you to Christ? What good is it for me to tell you, you need to accept this message and not tell you Jesus loves you? Everything we do and everything we read and everything we watch, listen, should lead us to the amazing and overwhelming love of God. So now, what time is it? Might have to be three parts, church. I don't know. Um, let's go to the revelation here. Let's go to the actual revelation of the message of the prophecy. So Daniel's prayer, he's alluding, right? He's alluding to the 70 years of desolation brought upon Jerusalem and Judah because of their rebellious actions, because of their lack of repentance, right? Daniel's saying these 70 years are... This is what I'm referring to, God. It, his, the beginning of his prayer tells you everything. This is why I'm praying, Lord, because I'm excited and I'm looking forward to how you are going to redeem us, how you're going to save us, how you're going to finally allow us to return to Jerusalem. This is the reason why he's excited and this is the reason why he's praying. He is longing. He is desiring for God to bring an end to the 70 years, also known as, in prophetic terms, as the 10 sabbaticals. We won't get into that. That will have to be another, another time. But the 70 years are also known as the 10 sabbaticals, 7 times 10. Sabbaticals, uh, seven years are known as sabbaticals. So this was 70 years, it's 10 sabbaticals. Anyway, so he's longing. He's saying, God, I'm, I'm, I'm longing for these 70 years to finish. And then will be the coming of the anointed one, of Messiah, because, church, Isaiah refers to Cyrus. You might be a little surprised. He refers to Cyrus as the anointed one, as a sort of Messiah. So Daniel's saying, hey, we, we can't wait for this anointed one. We can't wait for this Messiah, Cyrus, to come. I'm excited. However, church, God has a surprise for this old prophet. Have you ever expected good news? And when that, new, that news comes, it's even better than you expected it. You remember that feeling? Like you were expecting good news, but man, you, you hit it out of the ballpark. This is even better news. This is what God has in store for Daniel. He's expecting good news. But God has even better, superior and a bigger surprise for this old prophet. Because God is about, about to reveal to him not only that temporary Messiah, but he's about to reveal to him the ultimate anointed one. He's about to reveal to him the Messiah Prince, who isn't only coming for a temporary patch or fix, but he's about to present to him the Messiah that is going to solve all of humanity's problems. Daniel is in store for a surprise. 
You see, the prophecy of the 70 weeks is a universal prophecy. The prophecy of the 70 years is a local prophecy. The 70 years would give a temporary Messiah in Cyrus. The 70 weeks is a universal version of the 70 years because the 70 weeks would give the eternal Messiah in Jesus Christ. Can we say amen? Pastor Harold says, I'll say amen for you. Because Daniel is excited and happy. We're finally going to get Messiah to take us back to Jerusalem. And God says, oh, Daniel, I got the Messiah that's taking you back to eternity. Daniel, I'm going to give you Messiah. Yeah, I'm going to give you Messiah that's going to take you back to Jerusalem. But guess what, Daniel? Because you've been humble, because you've recognized your place, I am also going to give you the Messiah that is going to save humanity, not just Israel, not just Jerusalem, not just Judah. Not just the Jewish nation, but I'm going to give you Messiah that will save the world. Daniel's in for a ride. Because Daniel had his eyes fixed on the return of his people from exile to rebuilding the city and the temple. The fulfillment of the 70 years. But when Gabriel comes and the angel reveals himself and tells him, I'm here to expand your horizons, Daniel. You're focused on this prophecy here, but I'm here because God has sent me to open your horizons and expose to you that I'm not only restoring a city, but I'm restoring humanity. God isn't in the business of just patching a thing here and there. And yes, his love might allow to fix a thing here and there. When you lose your keys... Church, it's not bad to pray. Lord, I lost my keys. Where are they at? I looked, I looked, and I can't find them. And God says, here they are. But that's not God's priority, church. God isn't in the, in the business of just patching up and fixing things. God is in the business of saving your soul, of saving humanity, of restoring what was taken from him because of sin and the devil. And he wants to bring it back close to his heart. And so Daniel's horizons are expanded. He's given instructions on the 70 years. Yeah. Gabriel says, yeah, yeah, yeah. When the order is given to go and restore Jerusalem, yeah, yeah. He's given instructions on the 70 years. But he's also given the 70 weeks of years in the future when Messiah will finally come and restore humanity. That story, church, that prophecy of the 70 weeks that is given at the same time of the 70 years, climaxes, points, and uplifts the arrival, the ministry, the life, resurrection, death of Jesus Christ. Christ is at the center of it all. It saddens me when we say, no, that's baby food. Give that to the baby, the new members. Give that to the ones that just got baptized. Give me the solid stuff. I'm going to tell you today, once again, that when prophecy is shared the right way, and to me the right way is the biblical way, Christ is inevitable. The love of God will always stand out. We've just broken down a, a, a part of Daniel chapter 9, the prophecies of the 70 years and the 70 weeks. And the only thing we've talked about here is God's love. If you don't believe me, go back to YouTube and watch it. God's love keeps coming back. God's love. God's love. His mercy. His patience. Slow to anger. Forgiving. Saving. Redeeming. Church prophecy, when done right, will uplift the name of Jesus Christ. So family today, I want us to be clear that our understanding, especially as Adventists, our understanding of prophecy can sometimes be very, very short-sighted. Like Daniel. I don't blame the guy. But it can be very, very short-sighted. Yes, 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 it's happening here. God says, hold on a minute. I got something better for you. 
we sometimes focus on the prophecies and we, there's this desire to want to give interpretation to every new event. And God says, I have something better for you. God who sees beyond our wants sees the bigger picture. And his desire is for you and for me to see the bigger picture. Maybe the eclipse didn't have a meaning. Maybe it didn't mean anything. Maybe it was a natural phenomenon that happens every so often that God allowed to occur. And amen for that. God's bigger picture is that is he is soon coming for you and for me. Don't lose sight of that. Don't get lost in the little nitty things. Don't get lost in what so-and-so said about the eclipse that you lose sight of the bigger picture, which is that God wants to spend eternity with you. Don't get lost in the kings and the kingdoms and the nations and the events. Don't get lost in the 666. Don't get lost in the mark of the beast and lose sight of Christ's saving actions for you and for me. There's this desire sometimes in us to find a prophetic meaning to every event. We're addicted to, so what does this mean? The Pope sneezed. What does that mean for prophecy? The, 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 the church made this amendment. What, what does that mean? We're addicted sometimes to this desire to apply prophetic meaning when God's bigger picture says, focus on me. I am righteous. I am a mercy. Now, church, I'm not saying don't look at prophecy. Daniel was literally looking at prophecy because then some people turn around and say, pastor hates prophecy. Church. That cannot be further from the truth. We just studied prophecy together. We don't, how can we hate something that God has given us? We are not against prophecy. We are against the spirit that deviates our mind from Christ in prophecy. That message that puts Christ to a side and says, well, the numbers add up. Well, look at what this guy did, and this is where it matches up. We're against the spirit that sets Christ to the side and insults the numbers and the symbols. I want to invite you to bring Christ back. And when you're reading prophecy, when you're listening to prophecy, when you're studying prophecy, make sure that it always brings you back to the love of Jesus. So church, many, many are anxiously waiting for the Sunday law. Many are anxiously waiting for the persecution. Many, many are anxiously waiting for the signs of the end time. But today, church, I want you to anxiously wait to be with Jesus Christ. On top of all those things, they have meaning. They were given to us for a reason. But I want you to desire above all those things to be with Jesus Christ forever. Because, church, how much does he long to be with you? How much does he desire for you to live in eternity with him? Revelation describes to us heavenly worship. What time is it? Revelation tells us the songs that they're singing, the worship that they're rendering, the crowns thrown to the ground, the, the four living beings worshiping and the angels singing and the redeemed singing. And in all that worship that is being rendered to him are only people that want to be in his presence. They are not singing. They are not longing for the signs and the symbols. They are not singing and chanting and saying, yes, 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 those symbols, the 666, that stuff was amazing. No, they are singing to the one that made it possible for them to be there. And I want to invite you, church, to be part of that group. But the worship and the singing and the longing doesn't start in heaven. It starts here. We long for him here. We desire for him here. We worship him here. The longing for prophetic signs and symbols is not what his people desire. What his remnant, what his church, what his people desire is to be with him. There's, a, there's something that they say in Revelation. Until when will you allow this, Lord? We want to be with you already. 
As a matter of fact, it tells us that the blood of the saints call out to God because the desire of God's people above all things is to be with their Savior. So, church, I want you to tonight, to today, it's not night, I want you to today look at the resurrected king. Everything points to us back to Jesus Christ. And so my desire today and my prayer is that this church, this community of believers, longs to be more with Jesus. So Michael and John, I, I, I'm being upfront with you. We didn't plan that. But that song is exactly what our prayer should be. Longing more to be with Jesus. Share the good news of Jesus. Don't ever get tired. That's milk. That's baby milk. That's for, that's for the newborns. That's for the ones that just got dipped in the water. No, church. The love of God is the only thing we will be talking about for all eternity. Share that with the world that so desperately needs it. And in due time, we will be with him. Because he lives, you and I will also live. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, what else can we say but thank you? For you have done it all. Lord, you have manifested your grace, your love, and your mercy in everything you've done for us. From the smallest thing to the biggest thing, all points back to your love. And all we can say is, just like Daniel, is thank you for you are worthy. Thank you for you are righteous. Thank you for you are faithful. And so, Lord, today we want to appeal to that faithfulness. Today we want to depend on that faithfulness. Today we want to trust and hope on that faithfulness. It's not because of us, Lord. It's not because we know the numbers and the symbols. And, Lord, thank you for sharing those with us. Thank you for the spirit of prophecy and the gift of prophecy that you've given your church. But beyond all of that, Lord, allow us to never lose sight of your great love. Teach us to depend only on your love. Because what good it is for us to know all the numbers and yet lose you in our hearts. So today, to, today we want to renew our vows. We want to open our hearts once again. And Lord, we want to long for Jesus. We want to welcome him, welcome him into our hearts. And as we leave this place, let every individual from the smallest to the oldest be a, ve a beacon of that light to a world that so desperately needs to hear, not numbers or symbols, but a world that ne desperately needs to hear and see your love. Because, Lord, you didn't just come for a group. Your prophecy was, only, was not only for a, for a temporary nation, but, Lord, the prophecy points to us to an eternal Messiah. And it's that Messiah who came to save not just one nation, one group, but to, came to save all of humanity. Please let us share and give that good news to a world that bleeds for it, that desires it. Thank you, Lord, for calling us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for transforming us. We love you because you loved us first. And, Lord, we thank you for victory because if Jesus resurrected, which we are sure he did, we will also be resurrected. Be with us the rest of this Sabbath. Your name be exalted and praised. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath. May God bless you.